sounds good. That's prom promising. Good to go. We, we good to go? Yeah. Cool. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here during the lunch hour, um, especially during the summer. Very thankful for you to be here. This is part of the Shape the Trainer Summer Conference. Um, the session is titled Neurodiversity in the Workplace. Uh, my name is Joe Tyner. I use he, him pronouns, and I serve as the Assistant Director for Access and Accommodations at the Student Disability Center on campus. Um, and I'm very excited to be here with you all. Um, I know this is a topic that was specifically requested by um, staff in the, in the Lori Student Center, so I'm very happy to see that this is an app and happy to help. Hopefully, I can provide you the information you are looking for. Um, Uh, there we go. Okay. Um, I always like to start presentations I give um, talking about access needs. If I wasn't a very accessible and accommodating person, I would be very bad at my job. <laughs> um, so I would like to start this by just letting you all know that um, if you are, there should be live captioning provided if you're doing the virtual, um, the hybrid session. So through the Zoom, there should be live captioning. So if you want to, if you're already online, you should be able to enable those. If you want to, Join on your phone and just mute yourself. You should be able to access them that way as well if you need live captioning. Um, there is a copy of these slides available. You can access them using the QR code that is on this slide. So you can scan that. It should take you to a PDF um, version. You can download of these slides. Um, throughout this, throughout this um, session, please feel free to ask questions. I know some people are more immediate processors, and some people like to take time and think through things. And so. Um, trying to offer that flexibility to anyone. So if you have questions, don't feel like you have to wait till the end. Feel free to just speak up, ask them out loud. Um, you can put them in the chat and be will help read them out loud. Um, you can also, if you are virtual, you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask questions. Just feel free to chime in whenever. Um, feel free to do whatever you need to do. Stand, stretch, fidget. We do have a bucket of fidget toys up here. You're welcome to come yeah. utilize. Um, we do ask that you just return them at the end. They do go up to my office. Um, but I'll see if you leave this room or you'll never know. So you do that. Um, that stand stretch, if you need to like take a break and leave, I won't be offended. If you don't like what I'm saying, please leave, I won't be offended. Um, just do what you need to do to take care of yourself. Um, one request I ask of you all is, um, if you do have questions, feel free to just shout them out or bring them up out loud. Um, I'm blind, so if you're raising your hand or trying to send them to me, I'm not gonna see you. I promise I'm not ignoring you. So please feel free to just ask them out loud. So getting us started with, you know, we're talking about neurodiversity. Well, what is neurodiversity? And I want to start by letting you know that this, first off, this is not a medical term. Um, this is really just an aspect of diversity, and that the idea behind neurodiversity is that our brains, every one of us, our brains are different. We think differently, we process information differently, we act differently, and that's just part of, that's an aspect of human diversity, right? Uh, we can all, you know, do this, do similar work, work in the same environment, but we all can interpret um, information, process information, think differently, and that's just a really beautiful aspect of diversity. That's why, you know, we often will work in committees and teams because everyone can bring different perspectives to, to a group, right? And that's the diversity of thought. Um, oftentimes, neurodiversity is associated with a variety of um, intellectual or mental health disabilities. Um, this is often referred to as neurodivergent. So if um, you know, we're talking about neurotypical are um, those who don't have disabilities in the way our brains are just naturally occurring, developing, and different. And then there are those who have some form of an intellectual or mental disability, such as ADHD, autism, uh, dyslexia, dysgraphia, anxiety, depression, PTSD, OCD, any list of that that affects the way you think, process, behave, that can qualify as a disability and can, can when often is referred to as neurodivergence. So neurodiversity is just the idea of we are humans, we all can think differently and have a different brain. And neurodivergence is when there's some form of something that we can clinically diagnose to say like this is different, I'm going to use that word in air quotes, from the air quotes again, norm. Um, so really looking at it in that way, of, well, we'll often use neurodiversity as like the more umbrella term and then you'll hear some people talk about being neurodivergent which usually is aligned in alignment with having some sort of um, intellectual or mental disability. Um, 
I think neurodivergence is just the way we, you know, is again that diversity in the way we process, think, um, things that may be outside the norm. The definition I have listed here is not a published definition. It's actually one created by a couple of my colleagues, Annie Cunningham and Chrissy Gilbert, who helped prep um, some information for me for this presentation. So I wanted to give them credit. So they've now been officially cited, which they were both happy to see. Um, yeah. I mentioned again, it's not a medical term, which from the, as I was prepping for this presentation, well, what's interesting is I, you know, just Googled what is neurodivergence, just to see what was out there. And the se first several um, results that came up were from medical-based um, resources. So like the Mayo Clinic, um, Cleveland Health, University Health, like it was so interesting to say, like, this is not a medical term, but so many of the folks who are doing research on this are basing it in a medical lens. So that's just kind of an interesting observation I thought I'd share. Um, I was trying to find some good data on this to kind of talk about the relevance of this. And what was interesting is there wasn't a lot of great data I could find about neurodiversity or neurodivergence specifically. The data I was finding was a lot of basing about people with disabilities as a whole, um, which we know that's about 20% of the population. Um, have some form of disability, right? And that's not specific to a neurodivergent disability. Um, it was It's more that larger umbrella of disability as a whole. So I couldn't find any great data on like statistics about neurodiversity. The only thing I could find that was cited in a couple places was this, that 15 to 20% of people are neurodiverse. But I couldn't even find where that was cited from, but I saw multiple, multiple sources saying that number. So I took that as a place to start. <laughs> Um, I also recognize when I'm getting, when I'm presenting, I can talk really fast. So don't hesitate to say, Joe, slow down. I have no idea what you just said. Um, I'm happy to repeat things, clarify. Just let me know what you need. Again, trying to be flexible and adaptive for everyone. Um, we did have a video I was going to show, but we're having some tech issues, and it really just reiterated some of the things I just shared, so we're going to skip over that. Um, so when we talk about neurodiversity, um, with, you know, um, when you talk when you talk to me in my work, I talk a lot about people with disabilities encountering barriers, right? Things that we as society have created these barriers in our culture, our environments, our society, because things you know that we they exist because of something doesn't fit in the in that norm. So people who are neurodiverse um, or neurodivergent can encounter a lot of barriers in the workforce, right? That's the thing we're talking about really today: is neurodiversity in the workplace, and these are some of the common barriers neurodivergence or neurodiversity um, can encounter. And that can be things like um, focus, social norms, communication, um, overstimulation, um, but with both light or sound. You'll talk to some people who, in rooms like this where there are overhead lights, um, that can be really overstimulating for somebody. Um, specifically, I know fluorescent lighting tends to be a very triggering thing for a lot of people. We're fortunate that with um, a lot of CSU's newer buildings and renovated spaces, we're moving towards LED lighting, which is still, you know, harsh overhead lighting, but isn't as triggering as fluorescent lighting. Um, same with sound. Um, people who um, have different aspects of neurodiversity can go into space and have a lot of sound be really overstimulating for them, and that can make it really difficult to process, to think, to really stay centered and focused in the moment. Um, same with focus, um, just staying you know, concentrating, focusing on one thing um, could be a barrier, or someone can get hyper-focused where they are, are not paying attention to anything other than this one thing when they're working, right? It can kind of be a variety. It can be a spectrum of how somebody encountered these barriers. Um, communication, again, and the way we process, understand information, whether that's communicating externally, um, speaking outward, or communicating and writing outwardly, or interpreting what people are communicating to us um, internally. Oh, excuse me, Joan. Yes, Chris. Would people mind if we dim the lights a little bit? Because I'm having problems reading the screen. Oh, yeah, if you can ever okay, come and like dim the light, that's a great idea. Uh, I can try to figure okay. it out. Thanks, Rachel. <laughs> Thank you. See? Thank you. Thanks, thanks, for, thanks for pointing that out, Chris. <clears throat> Basically, it's that one right up there. Is that better? No, because it's that one down there. Oh, cool, that works. Yeah, I can this work? that better. This work for folks? Cool. Okay. Because it work for me. Thank you. Um, appreciate that. Let me see if we can adapt. Um, uh, communication. 
Um, and some of this can even come just interpretation of words and language, right? We know that English language is a very complex language and we have a lot of words that can mean different things and different circumstances, um, tone, body language, all these things can be processed and interpreted differently, right? You can have two people who are talking to the same person and they could each interpret what that person is saying differently. Um, so sometimes it's helpful to, um, and we'll actually, we'll get into what can be helpful in these things, but these are just some of the common barriers that people who are neurodiverse or experienced neurodivergence um, can encounter. And we're gonna talk through some ways of how to make a more um, inclusive and neuro affirming spaces in our work environments. Okay, so moving into like the practices of how to be more neuro, neuro affirming or neuro, neuro affirming and neuro inclusive. Um, so some general practices is first and foremost being flexible, right? Um, well, you know, as we have learned from COVID, right, we have a lot of flexibility we can offer employees and staff and I'm going to encourage us to continue to offer that because that enhances access, access um, enhances inclusion for individuals with disabilities who are neurodiverse, neurodivergent, um, but being flexible. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I apologize. My allergies have been um, very bad recently, so I will uh, stop up. Uh, accepting you know, neurodiversity as an aspect of diversity, right? So accepting that diversity of thought, that different, um, how we interpret different things, think, how we can contribute um, to the workplace and to the team culture, right? Um, look at those as strengths, not see someone as like, oh, why are you thinking that way? Or why did you um, do your process this way? It should be this way. It's not being stuck in one, any one way. It's um, let's embrace that diversity if we can get to the same destination through multiple paths. And how we do that can really enhance productivity, enhance efficiency. Um, so embracing that as an aspect of the diversity of thought in our workspaces. I'll just try to refresh myself on my slides. Yeah. And most importantly, apps don't assume, right? If so if, um, when you're working with employees, whether that's someone you supervise, whether it's your supervisor, whether it's your colleague, you know, ask them, how do I, you know, you should do this for anyone, how do I support you? How can I be a good colleague, a good supervisor, a good supervisee? What's your communication style? What's your preference in giving feedback? Um, how do you like to work? Do you like to work independently? Do you like to work together and we can help each other stay on track? Really. Um, opening up a dialogue on how do we create a supportive um, work environment and work culture and not assuming, right? If someone does share that they are neurodiverse or neurodivergent, don't assume anything about what that means for them, right? Every person is going to be different, right? Some, um, some people might like really explicit communication. They want to have it in person. Some people really want it in writing. They want it to be, you know, short and sweet to the point. Some people want it really drawn out, right? So just ask, don't assume. Those are the big things I can really um, encourage in general, and we'll move into a couple other pieces in the work environment. So meetings. At CSU, we love a good meeting, right? <laughs> we love meetings to plan meetings. We love meetings to, to debrief from a meeting, right? Um, I hope everyone can laugh at that, because <laughs> we know it's true, um, right? And meetings can be a, um, really helpful and productive, and they can also be a barrier at times, right? So here are some practices that we can do to make our meetings more inclusive across the board. So one is providing agendas in advance, giving people a heads up of, here's what this meeting is going to be about, right? If somebody, if you, for anyone, if you're like, here's a meeting, I'm not telling you what it's about, that can be anxiety provoking. That can be, I could come unprepared because I'm not sure what to expect, right? Having agendas shared in advance um, can be really helpful in making things more inclusive. Um, in my office, our agenda isn't gate kept by any one person, like in the author leadership, we have a, like a, um, a one drive document that anyone can add items to, to the agenda, right? That they don't have to send it to a supervisor. It's just, hey, if you have something you want to talk about at this meeting, put it on the agenda, right? It's collaborative, it's open to everyone so people can put things on that they want to talk about and they can see what's coming up, right? They can see, oh, next week we have a guest coming to our staff meeting. Or if I'm, you know, if I'm preparing for a meeting, I can see, oh, I see one of my employees wants to talk about this, right? I can prepare for that. Um, for some people who need processing time, they can give them time to know, cool, I know how to prepare myself for this meeting because I know what's coming. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Um, think about your meeting location, right? Again, we're talking about like light and sound being overstimulating. Thinking about can we have spaces like this where there's flexibility where we can have some lights on, some off? Um, are there windows for if you have a space with good natural lights and that you don't need overhead lighting? Natural lighting can be um, more comfortable for people. Um, thinking about the sound quality, right? Is it a place where there's a lot of carryover noise from the hallway? Are doors open? Are doors closed, right? Um, that meeting location can be really um, impactful to people, right? So thinking about that, and how do you add flexibility into that, right? <clears throat> um, offer breaks during meetings, right? Um, you know, if it's your meetings taking more than you know forty-five minutes an hour, build break time in. Give people time to take a bio break if they need a decompression break. Like I need to go and just sit and process what was just said before you move on. If I, you know. Just offer people that chance to take a break instead of making people sit through a two to three hour meeting without any sort of break. Um, it helps people feel, you know, get more included if they need to go to the bathroom, if they need time to process, if they need to get water, if they need to like refocus themselves and ground themselves, whatever that is. Um, allow flexibility, like I said. Um, so people need to stand, stretch, fidget, whatever that is, just normalize that. Allow that as a practice if somebody wants to stand for the meeting, you know, let them do that. They need to use a fidget toy or um, something like that. If that's, what helps them, if that's what helps them stay engaged, allow that and embrace that as a, as a piece of meeting culture. Um, provide summaries of meeting, right? So, um, so have somebody take notes in the meeting and share those out broadly afterwards, right? So if somebody won, if somebody wasn't there, they can find out what they missed. If somebody maybe has difficulty processing, and maybe not, maybe didn't catch everything in the moment, there's somebody who took um, good meeting notes, they can learn what they missed. Um, offer hybrid meetings. Again, something we know we can do. It allows people to maybe put themselves in a space that is more flexible for them, more inclusive, allows them to maybe focus better. Um, a lot of times, you know, using Microsoft Teams or Zoom have live captioning as a feature that can be enabled, so that can help people by if they can turn that on so they can see the captions, right? That I know for a lot of people who are neurodiverse, having captions turned on is a really helpful in them to stay focused or better processing the information. Um, so these are things that all can really help enhance and make your meetings more inclusive. And then for supervisors, um, again, be flexible, right? Talk to your employees that you supervise about how do I support you? How do I create an um, inclusive workspace? Um, what kind of work schedule works best for you? Do you like um, an eight to five, or do you need something a little more flexible, right? Do you take breaks, or do you like to just, you know, are you someone who wants to just chug through um, and get stuff done, right? Just be flexible. We know we have the flexibility. Let's try to embrace it and utilize it to, um, to enhance our productivity, our effectiveness, our inclusiveness. <clears throat> um, uh, let's see. Let folks know about the resources. So if somebody does um, is neurodivergent and need, has some sort of disability, ask if they need accommodations. Um, if it's something that you can do yourself, I encourage that. Um, let them know about the accommodation process for employees that's handled through the Office of Equal Opportunity. If folks need any sort of accommodation, that you know, let them know that that's something that you support and you want to support them and encourage them to engage in those processes. Um, a big thing I like to tell, you know, I focus on, um, what I tell people is focus on the end product, not the process, right? So if you give an employee a task to do, as long as they get it done to the standard you expect, does it really matter how they do it or when they do it, right? Um, as long as it's getting done. So really focus on, is the work getting done? Is it meeting the standard it's supposed to be, right? We don't want to compromise um, our work or make sure it's not being done to a quality level. But if somebody wants to work on it by themselves, if they want to work on it at home, if they want to work on it at 10 o'clock at night because that's when they're focused, or at six, 5 in the morning, right? As long as they're getting it done, give that flexibility, right? Or if they think, hey, you, need me, I, you told me to do this. What if I do it this way, to, which to them makes more sense, right? If, as long as it's not taking out crucial parts of a process or steps that need to be done, give, you know, a, open up the opportunity for folks to find their own process or their ways of doing things, right? Sometimes that leads to more efficiencies, right? Somebody may see a, a more effective way of doing something that you didn't see, right? And they ask them to share that back then, right? That could be something that benefits you, it could benefit the whole team. Um, 
Again, I relate to introverts who registered to communicate with their staff. Um, for all the employees, I supervise nine employees, and so I, when they get hired, I have them fill out a what I call a supervisor questionnaire. That's something a former supervisor of mine did to me, and I'm like, wow, this makes me feel seen, makes me feel valued, and so it's something I've continued on. And it asks for these things of like, how do you like feedback? How do you like communication? Do you like public praise? Do you like private praise? Right? And um, it's just like, what do I need to know as a supervisor to best support you so that we can both be um, effective at working together? Okay. Um, I don't know why that looks like. Um, I wanted to share a couple of resources um, before we broke, break into some discussion. Um, so the first is, um, if you're not familiar with um, CSU's reflection rooms, these are spaces that exist here in the Lord Student Center, they're throughout campus, but they're really a space people can go to, um, you know, meditate, pray, reflect, decompress. And so as I mentioned, people who get overstimulated, sometimes just having a quiet space where they can take a breath and kind of decompress can be really helpful. Um, and so these reflection spaces are becoming more and more popular among neurodiverse people as a quiet space where I can go, I can decompress, I can take some time, right, whether it's to meditate, do mindfulness, um, just have a, space, have a space away. So let people know about those. Try to, you know, if you see them in the Student Center, point them out to people like, hey, that's what that is, you know. Um, the, if you download the slides, these are hyperlinks, so you can actually get to the website that says where these are. Um, so that can be really helpful. There's a great guide on here I found online about neurodiversity in the workplace, a guide for HR, right? So again, more for supervisors, for human resource people of like, how do we embrace neurodiversity as part of our work culture? How do we help it to maximize our productivity and effectivity? And how do we create that inclusive space? So that's a great resource. There's a neurodiversity network. Um, this is a organization I found online that's focused on neurodiversity in the workplace and helping employees just feel like they're part of a network and supporting each other. So these are just resources if you want to learn more, look more into this, or if you have employees you want to share this with. Okay, I've done a lot of talking. I want to encourage you all to break into groups um, and be if you could help the Zoom people break into a breakout group. Okay. Um, and what I want you to do is get with you know, two, three, four people were smaller crowd than I thought, so even, you know, two to three is good. And I want you to talk through some things about, you know, what are you currently doing in your space that can be, that is neuro-inclusive, or maybe you didn't even know this what, you, what it was, and you're like, oh, I've been doing that all along, right? Um, what are some things you can do, and what is one thing you can do today, commit to, to increase um, some more neuro-inclusive practices in your workspace? If you want to just take some time to talk through this, talk through um, from the you know, things you have, and then we'll for, um, come back in a few and share out. No problem, and this is Rachel Joe. Oh, Rachel. I swapped out for B. Oh, no worries. Thanks for letting me know. Yeah, no problem. Uh, did you want to do about five minutes? Uh, five again? or ten. Five to ten? Yeah. How about I'll set it for an automatic ten and I can always close. Yeah, and we can always give them a, like, we're blowing you back sooner. Yeah. Cool. How many people do we have enough to end up with online? We have one, two, three, four, I think five. This is being silly. So folks joining us online, I am about to send you into a breakout room so that you can chat about what Joe has shared. I will be sure to put those discussion questions in the chat so you can take them with you. Thank but you should get that invitation in just a second. Thank you. No problem. Uh, we have one, two, three. Yeah, we have four. So four cool. folks on line. Fantastic. And they are joining. So let me just chat to them in the breakout room. Actually, I might be able to. Do you mind if I use your computer to screen share to the breakout room? I wonder if they can do that. Uh, yeah, you're right. You're right. I'll take care of it. I'll just retype it. No problem. Do you want to back up your back up one slide to those questions, and I will make sure that I get them the correct questions. 
um, yeah, yeah, yeah. for me, I work in the or I work in the Um, some of the things that we can do pretty good is like for meetings, we can kind of like make our own budget with that. Okay. Um, we also just reach there and get to get back to it. Yeah. Um, my keyboard wasn't scrolling like it was supposed to. Is maybe just writing agendas. Um, and then I'll just maybe Folks, if you want to wrap up your thought, um, and we'll come back together and just um, as soon as you finish your thought. Wow. Awesome. Well, sounds like y'all were having some great conversations. So thank you for engaging with each other. I know breakout discussions are not everyone's favorite. So thank you for engaging. Um, I want to open it up now just to, for people to share out. Um, again, feel free to just speak up. Um, Rachel, if you can, if anyone puts things in the chat but, um, as well, but if you're online, you can unmute yourself. We will be hear you through the, through the owl. But if you just want to share out, um, again, maybe some things that you already are seeing, you are already doing, your department already doing to be neuro inclusive. Uh, in I work in operations. Um, we, uh, and in different sort of tasks and different sort of problem flows, we're all fairly good at um, having that conversation of like, do you want to work by yourself? Do you want to work in a team? Um, how do you want to approach this this task? Um, is there a better way that we could be going about this? I think that's one of the better things we've done. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Other things you think that your, your offices are already doing well? Um, at the information desk, I think that we do a pretty good job of like offering um, fidget like toys to people during our meeting. Um, I think maybe one thing that we could do better is maybe providing like a meeting agenda because um, I we don't do that, so maybe just kind of starting to implement that. That's a great idea. I like your idea of the like an onboarding survey mm -hmm. to some people may not want to face to face answer some of those questions, mm -hmm. but would feel a lot more comfortable being able to express themselves in that way. I think that's a really useful tool. I wish I could take credit for that, but I think the performance supervisor of mine did that. I'm like, ooh, I love this. <laughs> and I've heard from my employees I've given it to, they're like, wow, this makes me feel like. It, I've been hearing good feedback from the employees I've given to that they feel they are appreciative of it for that same thing. Like, it just gives you a space to even like process that too of like, how do I like feedback, right? If you ask me that first time, I'm like, I don't know, <laughs> right? But then it gives you time to think about it, like, oh, click and think, and you can people can engage in it in their own time, right? They say, here, here's this, like, you know, give it to me by the end of the week or something, right? It gives people some time to think through them too. Our group uh, also talked about what access students have to medical care and like being able to be diagnosed with certain um you know different abilities and the cost that comes with it so having an onboarding survey would allow them to still receive those accommodations without them needing to provide anything on yeah. on paper that, no i appreciate you bringing that up because that's very true for some, um, you know, if you haven't already been diagnosed with, any, with a kid with a like a learning disability, mental health condition, whatever, sometimes it can be really costly and burdensome to get that right. If you go through a full psychological evaluation, that's thousands of dollars, and usually there's several months of waiting to even get on to, to get in one, right? Um, so that's a real barrier for, for some people, right? And depending if your insurance covers that or not, can vary. So I really appreciate just that openness of like, you know. Maybe it's not something you're getting as a quote unquote like disability accommodation, but again, how can we just be an accommodating space um, and that creating that culture in the, in an environment? Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. What else came up in your group, sir? Anyone online want to share out? No. Not yet. <laughs> and that's not, not me calling out. Just just, just <laughs> trying to make sure I hold space for the virtual folks as well. I was not an online human. I apologize. <laughs> okay. Does the spam call one eight? Don't share out. No, I don't think so. <laughs>
And again, I'm not going to make it even sure. If you don't, if you feel like you, you don't have anything to add, I'm not going to make you share out. Um, but I can also transition this into: do there, Are there any questions folks have? Um, are there things they want to put into the space? Cool question. Yeah. The Student Disability Center that we have in this building. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's rarely everyone, anyone ever there, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and there's just a note on the door that brings you to somewhere else. Do mm -hmm. you know what that space is being used for? That, that's a great question. Thanks for asking that. Yeah, so my office, the Student Display Center, um, our main office where the majority of our work is done is over in the Tilt Building. Um, the space we have downstairs is a small space that was given to us um, along with the other cultural resource centers. Um, when the student center was revitalized in, I think, phase one or two, whatever that was, about 10 years ago. Um, it's not a very big space, so for us to do our main work out of there is not very functional. So what we've used it for is a community space for students. So students are welcome to go in there and, honestly, it acts as a great reflection decompression space. We've had so many students to go in there and say, like, it's a quiet spot in the student center, right? So if they need a place to sit between classes, eat their lunch, take a break, it's a good space for them to go. And that's what we've primarily been using it for. Um, so coming back from the pandemic was just allowing students to go in there and have a have a space to be in community with each other, um, where they felt like they could have a, some, some space for themselves with other disabled students. And my only concern with that space is that for a person in a wheelchair, mm -hmm. it's just, it's really very tiny. Yes, we recognize that and we don't have much control over that because it was just the space that was given to us. So we're trying to make the best of it, and those were things we've shared concerns with as well. So we have a question for you from online, yeah. Joe. So Catherine would like to know: uh, Do you recommend encouraging people to receive accommodations even if their specific environment, work, or school hasn't been limiting thus far? It's a great question. I always will encourage people to at least understand the process, right? Because if you're not encountering, you know, accommodations typically won't be provided if you're not encountering those kinds of barriers or have a need for them, right? And so if you're saying work or school is not causing an issue so far, you know, there may not be a need for accommodations at that time. But that doesn't mean that won't change later on. So at least understanding the process, like having a point of contact of this is who I go to, this is someone I have a relationship with, can be helpful down the line if that's needed. I was trying to pull my slide up with my email because people had other questions, but my computer is being weird. No, worries. Catherine says thank you. Thank you, <laughs> thank you Catherine. Uh, do you have any advice on how to approach a conversation with either a supervisor or a team that um, may not be as accommodating or understanding of what it means to be neurodiverse? Yeah, and that's a that's a great question, and that's not always an easy situation to navigate or an easy answer, right? I think, you know, and there's a couple ways you could approach it, right? I think if you have a good relationship with your supervisor, like if um, or someone in the team, like maybe having a one-on-one -on -one conversation first of like. If you're the one experiencing impacts from this environment or this team, right? Um, having a conversation with someone you trust first to say, hey, this is what I'm experiencing. I'm wanting to try to work through this, right? And so is it talking, is it something the supervisor can change? Like, oh, here's how I can support you as a supervisor, right? Um, or, you know, is it, hey, my supervisor's great, but this other employee is, you know, makes comments that are, um, are, are microaggression or is doing things that aren't inclusive, right? Is there something that the supervisor can maybe help address from a from you know supervisors have a level of positionality and power can they have influence to address that right um that can be one way um maybe um should, you know if you if your team is open to this kind of culture of having discussions around you know diversity and difference like maybe bringing this up as a hey, it's something i think we should all engage with or maybe there's some learning that can happen in that in a natural way that doesn't feel so pointed or called out um so other resources, right? Um, the university ombuds can help with conflict resolution and mediation, right? So if there is a more conflict that you want to address through a process, the ombuds can be a great resource. Um, as I mentioned, Office of Equal Opportunity can provide formal accommodations to employees. So that can be, you know, if it's rising to that level, you feel like you need an accommodation that can be um, at least engaging in the process or knowing what resources are available can be helpful. So is 
It's not a straight cut answer to anyone, but there's different ways you could approach it. Um, let's say you have uh, identified a coworker or somebody else in your workplace who, who probably is struggling in some fashion. How and they haven't like come to you to address that situation. Mm -hmm. How would you? Is it is it appropriate to approach and have that conversation, or um, or to ask if any resources are necessary for them, or anything like that? Great question. I think I think it's okay. I'm not HR, <laughs> so blanket caveat. But I think I think that is appropriate. I have faculty asking this all the time with students. Like, I see a student struggling. Like, can I even ask them what's going on? And I tell them, yeah. You, if you're doing it from a place of concern and care, right? I think you can say, like, hey, I've noticed you might be having some difficulty, or I've noticed you struggling. Like, is something going on? Do you want to talk about it? Right? Just opening that door to a conversation can be really powerful. It's up to the person to choose if they want to step through that, right? So if they don't feel comfortable or they're not in a place to talk about it, they can say no and just respect that. And then if they do, you know, open up and share, be receptive in hearing them, like, hey, I'm just, you know, acknowledge their feelings, acknowledge, you know, um, and let them know if there are resources too, like, hey, there's something I can help with, you know, let them know again about some of those resources that we talked about, the onbuds, OEO, just talking with, you know, as a team, other things that you can support with. But I, don't, I never will discourage people from it. You know, if you see someone who maybe needs support or is struggling, ask them, you know, what you could, you know, if they want to talk, if they need help. <laughs> I think that one of the tougher aspects of that is that someone who is struggling disengages and often looks like they're not being productive. And so our assumptions start to operate mm -hmm. that they're being lazy or not taking direction well or not completing the task, whatever, not listening. And so Opening that door is pretty critical. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, we as humans, we are ten. We we have biases, right? You can do all the personal development around combating your bias, right? And knowing that you have it is a good step, but we, it's still going to happen, right? So always being aware of what is our bias and what are we seeing, and what are we seeing from others too, right? I've experienced this in my office, right? Where. Um, you know, I've had employees asking about this other person doesn't need to be getting their work done. And it's that it's a bias of like you don't you don't see it, right? Just because you don't see them doing it doesn't mean it's not getting done, right? So, you know, is challenge your own biases and challenge others' biases as well. Any other questions or thoughts? Okay. Um, well, that's all that I have for us for today. I want to thank you all for again, taking the time to be here, especially over the lunch hour. I know that can be an ask, that's a that's a an ask for people to come to. So thank you for being here. Thank you for engaging. And thank you for asking for this topic. Right. Um, the fact that this was you know something that LSC staff asked for shows that this is definitely um, something people are wanting more engagement around. So. I hope this was helpful and insightful. Um, I encourage you to reach out to me if you have any further questions. My email is just joe.tiner, um, T-I-N-E-R, at colostate.edu. Um, again, so thank you for being here, and I'll be sticking around for a couple if anyone has any questions um, that you want to ask more one-on-one. -on -one, I'll do the best I can to answer them. Um, so thank you all. If you did borrow a pitch toy, just ask me if you, you return it so I can take it back to our office. Thank you all. Thank you.